Hi, Danielle. Marty and I are really excited to have you on our show today. We have been wanting to have you on to talk about the medicinal powers of mushrooms and adaptogens for such a long time. And we are just very honored to have you here today. And I have been using Four Sigmatic products for, gosh, over four years now on a regular basis. And I just love sharing them with people because of their, really their functional healing properties, which we're going to dive into today. So we know from our research of you that you have quite an interesting background and your journey, which has culminated in you becoming a key player in the worldwide mushroom movement and a deep love of fungi in everything you do. And so we thought we could just start out by you sharing your journey in a nutshell for our listeners today. Yeah, I'm so honored to be with you both. Thank you for having me. Uh, We have so much juiciness to get into today. So yeah, we'll start a very interesting journey. I never thought that I'd dedicate my life to mushrooms and fungi, but here we are. And when I think back of about all these different chapters, I was always the one that didn't have a set path. So people were like, oh, I want to be a doctor. Or I want to be, um, I don't know, an anthropologist. Or a lot of my friends were in geology and all these different fields. And I was like, I don't know, this year I'm a permaculture designer. And the next year I'm doing large scale industrial composting work. And the next year I'm doing seed sovereignty, food activism, protesting, and it was all over the place. But the core of it really stemmed from this love for the planet and environmental heart and being an activist. And I studied environmental philosophy in my undergrad and Uh, I ended up moving to Southeast Asia after that. And that's kind of where things really started to solidify in the herbal medicine and mycology world. So I got this job leading high school students on backcountry service trips. So we would go into three different hill tribe villages in the Thai and Indian mountains uh, for three weeks at a time, living with three different hill tribe villagers. And there was no running water, no toilet paper, uh, really rural settings. And we do different service projects related to education or water. So sometimes we were mixing cement all day and building water platforms. You know, other times we were adding a classroom to a local school. But it was that traditional living that really introduced me to connection to the environment, connection to the earth in a way that I never understood in the West. So we would forage for all of our food. There was always a medicine man or woman in the villages that we would go out and they'd come back with these teak trays. And on the trays, there would be different roots and fungi and different berries. And it was this hands-on understanding that in order to survive and thrive, it depended so intimately on the health of the environment around us. And it just sparked this fascination in in herbal medicine. Anyways, lots of stories from that chapter, my years out there, but I ended up moving uh, back to the States to formalize my education in herbal medicine. And I moved to Boulder, Colorado um, and attended the Colorado School of Clinical Herbalism. And something about me, I'm always looking for like, what's not being said? And so even within this wonderful herb program, there was very little conversation about mushrooms. And I went foraging for mushrooms the first time in India with a a host mom I was living with. And there was this deep amount of uh, lore and use case of fungi in the East. And I just wasn't seeing it in the in the Western education. And so that really piqued my interest. And I started finding all these other ways to learn about fungi. And I started growing them in my home and doing all these cultivation courses. And anyways, when I, when I ended up opening my private practice, um, the people that were coming to me were the perfect candidates for functional mushroom medicine. We can talk about what that looked like, but it was a lot of chronic illness and autoimmunity and the functional mushrooms were, were really the one safe and effective option that I could turn to to really bring that chi and life force and vitality back into so many of these bodies, regardless of what state of illness they were at. So I I became more and more in love with the mushroom medicine. And about five years ago, joined forces with a company, Forcematic, worn many hats from formulator to educator. I now run our innovation uh, and just really working on getting this ancient, incredibly powerful natural fungal medicine into as many bodies as possible in a way that 
honors the herbal tradition and really offers it in the way that we've been using it for thousands of years. Wow. I have so many questions. I mean, I could just ask you about Thailand for this whole podcast. That might have to be an offline conversation. Okay. So first of all, how long were you in Thailand for? I was out in Southeast Asia for about three years, but there was, there's been many different chapters. It's again, a whole nother story. I went for the first time when I was 15 as actually a student of this program. So I went to do service work as a 15 year old and saved up and went out there. And then I studied abroad in my undergrad there and learned to speak and read and write Thai and have a Thai host family. So that was a big thing. And then as soon as I finished undergrad, I took a one-way ticket and that was kind of the three-year chapter and then was out there again this past summer. And that's where I got engaged. So it, it, it's my second home. It's a deep place in my heart. That's amazing. It's a dream of mine to go there. I'm hoping to fulfill it very oh. soon. Um, <laughs> for you. (laughs) That sounds amazing. Uh, So, okay. You talked about going to school in Colorado, studying herbal medicine. Correct me if I'm wrong. So you dove into fungi, not necessarily within the coursework, but you kind of took it upon yourself to study it because they weren't providing you with the amount of information you wanted. And within that, and within you growing your own mushrooms you learned how to heal people from their ailments. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, it's a very uh, kind of classic amateur mycologist path where there wasn't a set curriculum for for fungi, even within this program, which is what I've since founded the program and teach mycology there now because it didn't exist. But yeah, it was very rogue. Of like, how am I going to start learning about this on my own? So um, my first mushroom teacher was this amazing guy, oh. Peter McCoy, who I'll do a plug for. And it was a lot of the hands-on growing. That was kind of my first introduction. And then medicine making. So really growing the the mushrooms myself. And then we can talk about uh, there's a very specific way to extract them in order to receive the benefits um, and and make sure they're bioavailable to our bodies. So doing this kind of home cultivation, home medicine making. Um, And when I was still in my program, our, our final project, one of you know, the things that within our thesis was to teach a class open to the public. And so I said, okay, I'll, you know, I've been growing mushrooms and reading every book I can find. Maybe I'll, I don't know anything, but I guess I'll teach a, a class. And so I offered it up as part of, you know, my thesis project. And I had almost a hundred people come into our classroom that fit 25. It was the largest class, uh, clinician taught class ever attended at our school. And it was this kind of aha moment of, oh my gosh, there's so much desire to learn about this. And this was, I don't know, seven, eight, nine years ago, there was such a desire. And I'm like, who am I to be talking about this? And yet we have to fill this gap. It it was just like, wow, there's a need and it needs to be filled. So it just kind of sparked this interest, but it wasn't until later after a few years of being in private practice where the kind of clientele that was attracted to my work were, you know, these people with, with so many different, whether it was like ailments that the Western world didn't know existed or didn't have a name for it, or so much of it was related to their immune system and gut health, which is of course interrelated Our immunity is our gut and vice versa. And the functional mushrooms were the perfect, safe and effective option that I could start with. So after a couple of years, I, without even kind of having a plan, my practice turned into a functional mushroom based treatment protocol. So I'd make individual medicine for every client and the forefront of that formulation would be a different functional mushroom. And this is where I really started falling in love with how they worked synergistically with bodies of all levels of immune suppression to overactive immune systems in a way that was so different than even the other herbal medicines I was working with. They really work at this root-based level to, to raise chi, to raise vitality so that the body has what it needs to heal and symptoms begin to go away without directly addressing those symptoms. Wow. And we, and that's what people call adaptogens, correct? Another word. There are about five functional mushrooms are kind of key five that are also adaptogens. 
Uh, and then there's many plants. So adaptogens, it's kind of funny, right? This is like, we love to categorize and group things as humans. So the label of adaptogen is from this Russian scientist, Dr. Nikolai Lazarev in 1947. So it's only like about 70 years old of this terminology adaptogen, but the species within that umbrella category have been used for thousands of years. So there's about 30 of them. There's a couple of things that they have in common that put them in this category together, but yeah, mostly plants. And then about five key functional mushrooms um, are also adaptogens. So can you just dive in, you know, for one, a lot of our listeners, this may be the first time they're really hearing about adaptogens. They may have heard the word, but they don't know exactly what that entails and really like how these mushrooms and herbs can support our body's key functions and allow us to heal. And maybe even dive into what you saw with your clients when you started, you know, experimenting and giving them these medicinal mushrooms for those with autoimmune conditions and other, you know, gut issues, like you said. Absolutely. So adaptogens are, think of them as this umbrella category. Similarly, we have herbs that are helpful for our digestion, right? Like carminative herbs. We have herbs that we use to put us to sleep, nervines and sedatives and hypnotic herbs. Adaptions are another grouping like this. So there's similarities among each of them. And yet they're all individual species that have different compounds that are going to offer something unique. But overall, what they have in common is they're all non-toxic. And so essentially what this means is they are more food-like. They can be taken every day without the body building a tolerance to them and needing to take more and more to have the same uh, or beneficial effect. And actually the history of taking them is usually as a daily tonic, as opposed to something you take once like a pill for an ill. So this non-toxic consistent use. The second is that they are normalizing. So rather than working to, you know, have a specific effect on the body, they're actually working to bring about a greater sense of balance and homeostasis. And so they're working on multiple of the 11 systems of our body at once which kind of ties into the third characteristic that brings them all into this category of being non-specific. So they're non-toxic, they're normalizing. Non-specific means they're not directly stimulating or directly suppressing. And this can happen on multiple levels, whether it's via our endocrine system, with the functional mushrooms, they are non-specific, particularly on the immune system. And so the key compound in them, we can get really nerdy or keep it surfacey, but they all have this polysaccharide, right? So this sugar Mm -hmm. and the sugar type are these one, three, one, six beta D glucans, but just think they're these sugars that modulate the immune system. So depending on the body that ingests the functional mushroom extract, the, if they're for me, I I'm not dealing with an autoimmune condition at the moment. So if I take functional mushroom, say reishi mushroom extract, for example, and maybe my immune system is a little more uh, vulnerable and underactive because I live in a big city and I'm exposed to a lot of antigens all the time, I could take that reishi mushroom extract and it might stimulate immune cell activity. But someone sitting right next to me, maybe one of my clients that has an autoimmune condition. So their immune system is overactive. They could take that exact same reishi mushroom extract in the exact same amount, but it would downregulate immune cell activity in their body. So I think of this like a um, cruise control for the immune system, but it's not just the immune system, depending on the adaptogen that you are ingesting, this kind of stabilization modulation adapting, right? It comes from the Latin word adaptare, which means to fit, right? Or to adjust is happening on multiple systems of the body. And so all these adaptions are so unique in that they have that stabilization, that normalization attribute in common, which is so relevant today where we are, we are thrown off kilter, right? Some things in our control, many out of our control, just the environment we're living in, the stress we're exposed to. And so When we think about how we can, you know, the human body has a small range of, it's like, whether it's our blood sugar or our temperature, or, you know, look at any system in our body, there's like a range where we are optimal and we thrive within. And so the adaptogens can really help keep us within that range. So we're not constantly 
thrown into a state of overstimulation, of stress, of anxiety, and then of, you know, adrenal fatigue and exhaustion and the state where we need time and nutrients and energy to be able to replenish and refill these systems. So yeah, in summation, they are helping us adapt to the crazy stressors of modern day life. And so a person doesn't necessarily need to know, you know, what the mushroom is helping modulate. As long as they're taking the mushrooms, they're going to modulate. The mushrooms are kind of doing the work. That's what I'm hearing. Yeah. The way I I like to think about them, it's so different from how we typically think like, okay, I'm going to take this one thing to help with this other thing. It's really important to approach these with like, okay, I know that there's these compounds that will modulate my immune system, but in turn, what's happening, you know, 70% of our immune cells in our gut. So what's being, what's being supported within my gut microbiome. And from there, how is that affecting my mood, which is affecting my focus. And so it's, it's really interesting, regardless of what someone is presenting with, right. And this maybe smorgasbord of symptoms that they bring to the table, when you get a functional mushroom medicine on board for, you know, consistently a matter of weeks to months um, to really start building that foundation, it's really amazing what begins to clear um, and what things they thought had nothing to do with stress or gut health or immunity or, you know, liver function, these like foundational organs that the mushrooms are addressing, what they, you know, how, how their vitality begins to kind of show up in new and unexpected ways. The mushrooms are meeting you where you're at. Like based Absolutely. on what based on what you need, the mushrooms are going to provide. Which is the goal of, you know, I, I don't know, we could talk about in both of your health practices and working with clients as well. But like for me, it's so important. Like step one is like meet people where they're at. So if Absolutely. someone like sometimes they have like a list in my head. I'm like, there's like 30 things I really want to tell you. And is we have to refrain and be like, mm-hmm. Where are you at right now? Is it, you know, changing your water to spring water? Is it adding a carton of berries into your diet this week? Is it, you know, starting to switch from sugar to coconut sugar? I don't know, like little things to meet you where you're at. And, and the fungi really do that in a way that's unique from all of our other plant medicine. I wonder why people are running out and buying mushrooms like crazy. I guess they're just will be after that. Yeah. So I'm thinking, can you tell us, you know, can we dive into the different types of mushrooms? I know I take some mushrooms. I'm very curious what you think of them, but like lion's mane and turkey tail and is it cordyceps? Is that how you pronounce it? And can you tell us, you know, about each one and kind of what it's supposed to support? Yeah, absolutely. So the the five big functional mushrooms that are also, or that I also argue are adaptogens um, are, as you mentioned, we, I have to start with reishi. Reishi is known as oh, the, right. the queen of mushrooms. So all of these have these incredible ancient folklore, like deep stories of reverence. Um, and reishi is such a great example. And in, in all of traditional Chinese medicine, there's thousands of different substances, different ingredients they use. Some are plants, mushrooms, animal parts, and they rank them into three categories. And the top category are called superior herbs, superior tonics, and reishi is the number one of all superior tonics. So in the entire TCM, Materia Medica, reishi is the number one ranked herb. It's not technically an herb, um, but it's so powerful. It has names like the longevity mushroom, the 10,000 year mushroom, the mushroom of immortality. Um, And it's really this, uh, there's so many identified compounds that are working together. So it's, you know, it's like we want to, we want to compartmentalize, like this is exactly what reishi is for, but rather we can talk about some key, maybe like three key benefits of, of the fungi. The first is really around stress in a unique way. So not being, not being suppressive or, you know, a directly like a nervine, but instead uh, helping our bodies react more efficiently to stressors and then getting us back into a state of equilibrium 
more quickly so that we're not thrown off by the stressor. So this amazing stress ability, Reishi has an affinity towards um, the heart, both as a cardiovascular tonic, but also energetically, it's thought to be a, a heart medicine. And then immunity is so key. So these kind of two big compounds, we can talk about the sugars and oils, the polysaccharides and triterpenes, uh, reishi is the most identified of all fungi. So 120 different polysaccharides and over a hundred different triterpenes. So really this like powerhouse, um, for our stress, for our heart, for our immune system. Wow. And you know, I've, I've taken reishi at night and I knew about the stress, you know, capabilities and helping our bodies react to the stressors, but I didn't know until I read your book, which we'll dive into in a bit about the longevity. And it's funny, I actually messaged my parents and I said, okay, you're already taking, they are taking, I think it's cordyceps or lion's mane in the morning with their coffee. And they've been doing that for about a year and they really like it. I was like, you have to start taking reishi too at night because it's going to help you, you know, with your longevity and living a long, healthy life. So I, I mean, I learned a lot by reading the book and I think it's just fascinating. It's like, we're all getting back to earth, to mother earth, you know, with all, with the mushrooms, especially it just, and it feels very grounding too. Totally. Um, which again, helps with the modern day stressors and us managing the stress. Cause at the end of the day, those stressors are going to continue to be there for the foreseeable future. And there's not a lot to some degree, there's not a lot we can do about some of them, but it's like how we manage the stress and how these mushrooms can help support that. Absolutely. I think of the mushrooms like preventative medicine for the stress that's inevitably always coming our way. Like right. we're not going to get rid of environmental toxins and microplastics and Teflon pans and, you know, all these stressors, we can meditate and do our breath work and eat cleaner, but like, this is the world we live in. So how do we prepare ourselves and have this foundation so that we're not so triggered by the stress and we can allow it to happen and still move on with our day in somewhat of a state of peace and grace. Before you continue to tell us about these other mushrooms, the big mushrooms, or maybe as you're telling us, can you tell us how much a typical person should take of each mushroom? Yeah, this is a loaded question. <laughs> okay. So much marketing riffraff out there, which is like, right. I am so happy to be having conversations like this because there's so many times just to kind of summarize how much of an issue this is 75 or it's 74% was the recent statistic of reishi mushroom products on the market contains zero reishi mushroom. Oh my God. Unbelievable. This is a huge issue. So before we even get to dosing, it's like, how do we become knowledgeable consumers and shoppers? Because the most expensive supplements are the ones that don't work. Mm -hmm. And especially in the mushroom space, it's so new to people that we're used to the marketing techniques of other industries like cannabis, you know, so having two milligrams when you need 500 milligrams or 200 milligrams or, you know, words like full spectrum when that has nothing to do with mushrooms, you only need a specific part of it. So I guess to, to, to break this down before we get into dosing, there are three key components to look for when you are purchasing functional mushrooms in the marketplace. The first is ensuring that you're getting the real mushroom. This might sound strange, uh, but the majority of products on the market use words like mycelium, primordia, full spectrum. They're basically all marketing terms to avoid the fact that they're not actually using the real mushroom or only part of it. The real mushroom means it's the it's technically called the fruiting body. So think of it like the apple on a tree, right? Uh -huh. If you the apple is what contains all of these awesome nutrients that we consume and our bodies recognize. And there's a history of people eating apples right throughout time. Imagine going to buy an apple at the store and someone giving you a piece of the bark of the apple tree and being like, Oh no, th this will do it. This is, this is also the apple tree. And you're like, yeah, but that's not where the medicine is. And so it's happening in the mushroom space is there's the root system of the fungi uh, which is actually the majority of the species. It's called the mycelium. Uh -huh. the myce it's amazing for so many environmental things. Like I mean, oil spills, right? I read a whole thing about that. Mycoremediation, the ability to clean up toxic waste. Uh, people are making uh, different biomaterials out of it. So there's like mycelium leather and people making meat alternatives and like 
so awesome environmentally, which, you know, is a huge part of my passion. But when it comes to the medicine, the, the only part that has been used in the several thousand years of anecdotal history we have is the mushroom itself. So this is what's visible to the human eye. It's what the mushroom offers us right out in nature um, versus this mycelium. It's very new, couple decades. Um, it's impossible to harvest in nature. And so it is only able to be grown in a sterile laboratory environment. So, so different when we think about something grown in a lab environment versus out in nature and specifically with our mushrooms and really all of our adaptogens. There's this phenomenon called xenohormesis. Xenohormesis is when a plant or a fungi is exposed to stressors in its environment. It's the compounds that it develops in response to those stressors that make that give it the medicinal properties. So for example, you know, rhodiola grown in like extreme conditions in Iceland, like rocky soils and huge temperature fluctuations. In response, it, it develops all these polyphenols which help it survive in its wild environment. But those are also what lead to the many of the medicinal benefits that humans gain from consuming that rhodiola root. So what is happening out in nature, getting mushrooms in their wild environment um, actually ensures that they contain the compounds that are beneficial to our bodies. So, so a huge different when, difference when it comes to a lab grown mycelium, you know, that hasn't been exposed to, to any potential invaders, right. Versus like out in nature, it's constantly developing immune protective compounds. And that's what, what makes these so powerful. So all of that to say, we've got to find products that use the real mushroom or the fruiting body. And the second piece is we have to have mushrooms grown on wood, right? These are, this is like a key difference within uh, the fungi space. A lot of mushrooms that people think about, the culinary mushrooms, the psychedelic mushrooms, the poisonous mushrooms, those all grow from the earth, from the soil. And functional mushrooms primarily grow from trees, from wood. Huh. It wasn't until the 1970s that fungi were identified as their own kingdom. So they used to be thought to just be a lower form of plant. And then we realized, wait, they, they're actually nothing like plants. They're actually, we as humans are closer related to fungi than we are to plants. And one of our key similarities is our ability to consume nutrients. So fungi can't photosynthesize like plants. They actually need external nutrients to, to grow just like we do as humans. And so like we are what we, what we eat, fungi are what they eat. So a lot of their medicinal compounds are actually coming from the compounds in the woods that they evolved to grow on. And what we see in a lot of products today, especially if you of U.S. grown mushrooms, are almost always grown on different grain, just cheap substrates, rice, oats. And I think of this like in the animal world, it's like people know the difference between a grass fed free range meat. They're like, oh, yeah, that's going to be more nutrient dense, higher quality versus a cow that's been fed like GMO corn and soy and nutrients it never evolved to eat. Same thing with our fungi, right? Like if they're fed the birch, if chaga's fed birch bark and reishi is fed different hardwoods, like those are what compounds will be present in the final product. So, so different than a mushroom that's been fed just grains. How Great. would a person know that by looking at a bottle? Yeah. Great question. Um, it's actually really simple. So on the ingredient label, if the mushroom is grown on a grain, the company has to disclose that grain. So it will say oh. other ingredients, rice, other ingredients, oh. other ingredients, barley. And so you should know there should never be fillers in your mushroom product. So if you see that other ingredient and it's a, it's a grain, that should, that should be like your first red flag. Red flag. Okay, that's, um, this is so helpful because, you know, just like supplements, this is very overwhelming for people. Totally. Yeah. It's like, how could anyone know this? Okay. I can't wait to go look at mine after this conversation. I know, that's what I was seeing just the ingredient list. Yes. And what's so interesting, I do this in my first day um, with my mycology students, uh, is we taste. So if you have capsules, always important to open them up and taste them. And you can taste a 
mushroom that's been grown on, that's just mycelium on rice, right? Which oftentimes there's like 90% of that filler, that grain in there, and like 10% mushroom roots. So you're actually getting, you can taste it, it tastes like graham cracker or like a rice cake versus <laughs> a full mushroom fruit body grown on a tree. It's like sharp, bitter medicine. And so like opening and tasting will be, your your body will tell you which one is medicine. Actually, huh. that's a good idea, Marnie. We should do that yeah. before we even look at the bottle. And see yeah. If can... yeah, and the color too, like a myceliated grain product will often be like a light, almost like cream color, like similar to the grain color versus um, the the real like fruit body on wood will be like a dark, right? Like deep, you can see that almost like, Sometimes it's almost black in color if you're using a chaga or a reishi. And there's so many medicinal compounds, right? As we know, and into those deep, darker hues. There's a third component. We have the fruiting body. We have the wood. The third thing before we even get to the dosing is extraction. People sometimes think this is like a not positive word. I had a chapter of being a raw foodie and a raw food chef. I have a big place in my heart for that. But unfortunately, mushrooms cannot be consumed raw if we want to reap the benefits from them. Hmm. Mushrooms, they contain a compound in their cell wall. It's called chitin. It's the same compound you find in crustacean shells. So think of like a crab shell or shrimp shell or lobster shell. It's very hard. And our body doesn't contain chitinase, right? We don't have the enzyme to break down chitin. And so what happens is this this chitin acts like a big door binding all of those polysaccharides and triterpenes and all the amazing medicine from our bodies being able to access them. And so when we look back at the history of um, medicine men and women using fungi, they always put them in a big cauldron, right? It's like they boiled the mushrooms. They make stews or soups, broths, right? These long boils. And so we know that hot water breaks open that chitin cell wall and releases all these compounds into, into that tea. We also know now that alcohol is another method. So ethanol will also break open that chitin. So using, you know, mushroom tincture or a tea, but the key word to look for on a product is extract. And that will tell you that the compound, that it's actually bioavailable, that your body can use it all. And it's so crazy because there's so many products on the market that just grind up raw mushrooms, even if it's a real fruiting body that's grown on a tree, they'll just grind it up. And the body uses that like an insoluble fiber, right? It's like, it's not bad. We know the importance of insoluble fiber, but right. it's like a brush through our intestine. We're not yeah. getting <laughs> It's, it's a waste. Roughage. And it's, it's a, a waste. Fiber. <laughs> it's a total waste, especially in, I mean, I'm in LA and there's like, you can get chaga chinos and like add mushroom powder in your coffee or in your smoothie. And my first question is like, is that extracted? Because so much, and you can read the fine print too. If you don't see ext- ext- the word extract on the label, again, don't use it or extract it at home yourself, right? Then you should go make go boil it. But a lot of these fine prints will say like for best results, boil for four to eight hours. It's like, who's going to get a powder? (laughs) Boil it. No, I want it right right away. Right. So yeah. And it's so confusing because like on the shelf, I'm going into this because, you know, like for Sigmatic, we obviously do all these things and there's other brands that do that, that we can share. But it's so much more important for people to know what to look for, because really within the space, there's like new brands coming out every day. And so how do we become smart consumers and really believe in what these can do? And what is happening today is like you see a Four Sigmatic product or something on the shelf that has been, you know, we wild harvest our chaga from the forests in Siberia and they're coming from the birch trees and we extract them and then make this really potent Uh, like 500 milligram product and you see it next to another product on the shelf that's just 90% oat with a little bit of mushroom roots and they grind that up without extracting anything and that's like two grams because they've just weighed the oats essentially and so you're like oh do I want 500 milligrams or two grams I mean the person's like well the two grams seems like a bit better bang for my buck and yet it's so far from the reality of where, where the medicine is. 
Yeah. Wow. That was really, really helpful. That was super educational for myself. And I know it will be for all of our listeners. And that's what's so great. Maybe we dive into your the book that you and Taro both co-authored, Healing Adaptogens, The Definitive Guide to Using Super Herbs and Mushrooms for Your Body's Restoration, Defense, and Performance, which is a mouthful. But um, <laughs> I love how it's divided up into those three you know, areas, the defend, the perform, and the restore. And we've already kind of talked a little bit about some of those. You know, given that we're kind of in cold and flu season, as we start, maybe we could talk a little bit about immunity and how mushrooms can really help to build your immune system and your gut health. And if you want to touch on some of the specific mushrooms that will really help for immunity, I know we started out talking about reishi and we got a little bit sidetracked. So you could, you know, touch on some of the other big, you know, super mushrooms, if you will, that a lot of people will start to see if they haven't already. Yeah, this is such an important question um, when it comes to supporting our immune system, especially like change of season and when it's getting colder. A lot of times people look at herbal options and they look at just immune stimulants, right? So like echinacea or elderberry or organ grape. And these are great for a very short period of time, right? It's like I'd say, don't take echinacea for more than seven days in a row because it's tricking really what it's doing is you know, there are these alchemides when you take echinacea on your tongue, there's that tingle. And that's, that's essentially tricking your body to saying, Hey, there's an antigen in my system. And so it ramps up production of white blood cells to, to fight what it thinks is, you know, that, that foreign invader. And this is great to like at the very early signs of the sniffles or, you know, a flu coming on or a cold, but, um, long-term it's actually dangerous and detrimental. And so the mushrooms are unique in that, they have this modulation effect, right? So not only did the ability to stimulate, but they can also downregulate. So it's one of the, the safest things to take long-term, right? That you can take for the several weeks before the season changes, as well as, you know, into the season as well to ensure that your immune system stays strong, you know, for several months at a time. There's two mushrooms we haven't mentioned that are really relevant for immunity specifically. Um, we have chaga, which is... I usually have chaga around. Well, if we do a video, we can show. I actually have a few chaga here. Um, this is chaga. So it's like people have an image of mushrooms. These don't look like the mushrooms people are used to. And like rock hard, right? we got to get a sense of that chitin. Yeah, really, really deep black. When you brew it, when you extract it, it has like a dark black bitter color. It's used as a coffee alternative in Finland, where our company is from. Um, and it, that black color is actually where many of the, the medicinal components come from. So chaga is the highest antioxidant containing food on the planet. It's literally off the charts. You know, we think about like cacao or blueberries or acai. Chaga's antioxidant load is, you know, triple to tenfold some of these other high antioxidant rich foods, which of course is is so relevant all through the year, but especially during flu and change of season it contains key components like sod superoxide dis- dismutase. Um, it also contains melanin, which is really interesting. So um, it grows in really Northern climates where they're more vulnerable to sun exposure. And so it can be used as like an internal sunscreen, really interestingly. Uh, traditionally in a lot of cultures, it was used topically as a wash um, for different skin conditions. We know, you know, it's reflecting what's happening on our skin is such a strong indicator to the state of our gut health and our liver. So yeah, really key functional mushroom. Think of it as like your, we call it like your bodyguard. Your, <laughs> so it's like, even if there's like a bunch of people like coughing on you, if your system is loaded with this chaga, it's like you have this shield and you're not going to catch what everyone else has around you is kind of the fun. I have a question about that. Like I'm looking, I'm looking at you holding this mushroom and I'm picturing, okay, I want to take chaga. Am I taking a pill? Am I drinking it in a tea? Am I putting it on my skin? Like, <laughs> what, yeah. what is the best way to take it? Yeah. So if you are getting an actual chaga from birch trees that's been extracted, take it in the way that works for you, right? These have to be used consistently. The medicine doesn't work if you don't take it. Um, so capsules, there's a couple great capsule brands like, um, mushroom revival has an awesome capsule or mushroom, mushroom science, JHS, 
for Sigmatic, we really believe in um, tasting the, the medicine and the medicine starting in your mouth. So we add it into coffee. We have an elixir. It's like our version of a chaga tea um, or different powdered blends that you can add into soups or smoothies. Yeah, it's, you know, really making sure you're getting like checking off that list. And then do you already take capsules? Do you already drink coffee? Like really finding a way to to braid it into the routines that make sense for your life. Okay. So there's no one magic way. As long yeah. as they check the boxes, take it, whatever works for you. Yeah. There's like definitely ways that um, we can make it the most effective. Like for example, you know how you add like black pepper to turmeric to increase the anti-inflammatory. Mm-hmm. And with a lot of our functional mushrooms, we want vitamin C to be added, ideally from a, a natural food source of vitamin C. So like a rose hips or acerola cherry. Um, and that actually increases our body's ability to use many of the compounds. So that could be like a, a great synergy. If I were to paint like the perfect picture, I would say take it 30 minutes before or after food um, in the morning and the evening. But again, more important than like hitting this perfect combination of ingredients and time is the daily use. So you really, you can't take it once and be like, cool, my immune system's good for, for the winter. So it's really more like, how do we, how do we make this consistent? And that looks different for every person based on what their daily routines are. And that's so fascinating. Because like, with anything, if someone's going to start adding mushrooms to their daily routine, do it in a way that's going to work for them with what they're already doing. So it's not like a new step. It's just adding one more capsule or adding, you like tea, great. Drink it in a, some tea or a little elixir. And I love yeah. the little, like you have the little travel packs, the little pouches, make it super easy to bring with you. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Airplanes. I'm like, oh my gosh. Yes. Getting yeah. hot and adding chaga packets on the planes. Yeah, I know. It's like, we have to, we have to make this easy. So, you know, Stephanie, that's it. It's like habit stacking is what I always talk about. Mm-hmm. Like whether we know we have habits or not, it's like go through your day, spend a couple days jotting down the non-negotiables. Do you always have a cup of water in the morning or do you always make your coffee or do you always, maybe it's not even something you consume. Maybe it's like you always step outside to I don't know, let your dog out or like, what are these things that are habitual and how can you just bring this new habit into that? And, and it's such a higher rate of success of continuing. If you can stack it on top of something that you're not letting go of and, and you've already built. Absolutely. So moving on a bit. So we had Reishi, we talked about Chaga, any other big hitters like lion's mane or, you know, turkey tail. Yeah. Yeah. Turkey lion's mane, turkey tail, and cordyceps are our last three and our five. I know I could talk for an hour about each of them, and I do. I do three hour lectures typically, which is <laughs> very dirty. But um, turkey tail really quickly um, has an affinity towards the gut specifically, along with that immune activity. Um, it actually contains um, prebiotics, right? Which we know are so important before probiotics to feed all of that healthy bacteria and fungi that are in our microbiome. So a really wonderful ally to take all through the year, but especially immune season. Um, cordyceps is so relevant because beyond its immune activity, it's actually the first fungi, uh, officially recognized as an adaptogen. So has this amazing ability to help us um, become resilient and respond to stressors and also an affinity towards the lungs, which I'm like, if there's any mushroom of the last couple of years, like cordyceps hits on all counts, it really helps with um, increasing VO2 max. So it can actually um, increase the amount of oxygen that we're utilizing by up to 15%, which is critical, unbelievable when we think about it. That's like, crazy. Yeah. It's really crazy. I, when I did my like wilderness first responder course, my fiance teaches these for a living. It, you simulate what asthma feels like. And so you run around the block and then you're given one of those little coffee straws to suck into. And it's like, that's only the amount of oxygen that, you know, you're able to, to take in. It was such a powerful, like actual, you know, experiment for me. And then you take that away and actually allow your body to get that full breath. And it's, it's very similar to how cordyceps feels, um, especially, you know, coming from sea level and then going to higher altitudes, it grows at 14,000 feet, you know, it comes from the Himalayan mountains. And so 
the history is, of use, the Sherpas that would take it when they'd climb to these really high elevations where the air was thin to give them the endurance and the ability to, to get up, you know, to Everest and all of these Himalayan mountain ranges that they were crossing. And so, yeah, day to day, I mean, not only helping um, with that lung capacity, but with all sorts of exercise, you know, it's kind of been touted the athlete mushroom because when we take it before working out, our performance is, is very impressive. It's like, I almost recommend taking it post-workout because you can get so used to like your increased result. Like, wow, <laughs> star, <laughs> star. But it's, it's like this energy, this endurance without being stimulant, right? So mm-hmm. you don't have stimulation that results in the crash. You're just increasing the oxygen in your bloodstream. So, so really amazing. And then of course that's paired with the stress and the immunity benefits. Last but not least, I'll just touch on um, lion's mane. This is a dried lion's mane that's been sitting behind us, um, which is kind of cool. Yeah. It's, it's the one mushroom that's also a nootropic. Uh, so very, mm-hmm. very popular today. People want that cognitive support that's, you know, with memory and focus and there's so much going on stress wise. And I think that's actually more of an underlying issue of why we're not focusing. So always when we get to the root, but you know, if you do need that more acute support, lion's mane can be a really helpful ally in what's actually happening is there's compounds within the lion's mane that are activating nerve growth factor. Um, it's a, it's a newer discovered hormone in the body, um, in the last about 30 years, but it is really relevant specifically in the research with neurodegenerative diseases. So a lot of, you know, lion's mane being used and researched in conjunction with things like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and dementia, Mm. its ability to activate NGF and and start synthesizing neural networks and and activity, which is what leads to that that memory and that focus and kind of those more short-term effects for for cognition. So are there actual studies out there right now being done in this area or unofficial studies or trials or anything? Yeah. So one of the unique things about these kind of 20 to 30 adaptogens is um, over the past 70 years, they've undergone thousands of of clinical trials. We went through over a thousand um, to comb through in this book alone, but really different than a lot of other natural medicine, because typically it's like you can't patent it. So who's going to put the money behind um, doing a clinical trial? But uh, with these adaptogens, we have that that scientific lens as well, which is, this is so promising and makes them uh, more believable. It's like, regardless of the lens that you wear, whether you believe in the ancient use case or the, you want to say like, show me the clinical data that's there. And, uh, you know, another conversation of the faultiness of some of the clinical trials, right? Oftentimes they're studying like what a, a specific compound is doing to a specific disease and so much of the magic of the mushrooms and the adaptogens is their non-specific activity in nature. So it's like when we isolate one compound, which is what's happened, like uh, turkey tail is a great example. There's a, a compound that was isolated called PSK, which created Crestin, um, which is the, the number one anti-cancer drug um, in Japan. And so that was isolated and, you know, is now used, which is wonderful, but there's so much other synergy that happens when we use the full fungi and a lot of research doesn't work like that, right? They can't say like, oh, they're, they're looking to identify what is the constituent that's acting as one cancer cell line or, or that's, you know, they need that, that specific line of data, which is kind of the antithesis of what adaptogens are doing. Exactly. Which is the difference between this and taking an over-the-counter, very symptom specific pharmaceutical, right? Yeah. Exactly. Right. The isolated compound versus the compound in the matrix of the whole leaf or whole root or whole mushroom. And bottom line is, you know, from thousands of years of being using these mushrooms that they work and that they're helping people. So regardless of the studies, and I know there's a lot of that in your book, you know, and you're, you've seen it too in your own private practice. And is there like a success story or something you could share about how you really used mushrooms and herbs to help transform someone's health journey? Oh my gosh. There's hundreds. Yeah. I I go through actually, um, I think I put like at least six different healing stories, um, in the book itself, but every body is so different. And I think the theme 
with all of them is whether it's helping someone get off medications they've been on for several decades or preventing them from getting a new on a new medication. You know, a lot of this is like the case with autoimmune conditions. So many people put on immunosuppressants and really wanting to avoid that because once they're on the immunosuppressant, they're vulnerable to so many other diseases. And so um, the theme is, is building the gut, building the immune system so that the body, you know, it's like, it can never really say you cure a disease, but the symptoms often go away to the point that if you're not experiencing the symptoms, you know, why name yourself as having that, that ailment? So I guess separating yourself from the label, because so much of the label is wrong too. People would come to me like, I have, you know, toxic mold poisoning, or I have Lyme disease, or I have Crohn's or whatever the Lyme condition. It's like, okay, let's just focus on what symptoms you're experiencing and then work on building back these foundational, whether it's the gut health, different organ systems in the body, um, so that you no longer experience those symptoms every day. And that's where I think health comes from. And, and that's a greater picture of health is, is how we feel every day, as opposed to the labels that someone has, has pushed on upon us. Absolutely. And so basically if you are taking, I'm calling them the big five that you mentioned, you kind of are covering a lot of bases just in taking those on a daily basis, right? Absolutely. And you can stack and combine and yeah, synergy is like a whole part two conversation of what happens when we mix, you know, reishi and, and, cordyceps, for example, like awesome swimmer combination, or when we combine turkey tail and reishi, right? We have that elevation to our gut health and immunity. Like, so, so starting to play and the barrier to entry is so low, which is so different than many other natural medicines that it actually is relatively safe to say, go play, you know, always start slow and listen to your body. But these are a level one herb, right? And it's like, we have four levels based on the toxicity. These are so safe. So whether it's for, you know, younger individuals or elderly individuals, like, so it's, it's a really awesome place to begin your journey because the consequences are low. And I just want to throw out there, you know, we've had guests in the past talk about like psilocybin, what category, I mean, that's a, considered like a psychedelic, right? Yes. So I don't know if that's the terminology you use in mycology or, but that isn't like, okay, go play, right? That's we're, that's a whole different ball game. Totally different ball game. Yeah. The psycho, there's no psychoactive compounds whatsoever in any of these functional mushrooms. Um, I call them functional to denote that they're not medicinal or illegal in any way or psychedelic. So yeah, very different, like I know you have other episodes about psilocybin and another beautiful conversation, but yeah, definitely put it in a, in a different place. It's almost like remembering fungi are their own biological kingdom. As we mentioned, they're not plants, they're not animal, they're their own kingdom. So you wouldn't eat an onion like you would eat an apple, right? Even though they're both plants, you're not going to grab an onion and just start chewing it. That's going to have a really different effect in your body, right? So right. Think about our, our fungi too, just because they're both mushrooms, they're vastly different in terms of where they grow and what they're made of and what, what they do to, to the body. Super cool. So interesting. So if you're in the grocery store and you see like white button mushrooms and you go home and you saw Tam, do you think there's any benefit, any herbal benefit there or that's avoid, just avoid the white button mushrooms? The, you know, I'll tell you something, the, the white button, the brown mutton button, the cremini, the portobello, that's one mushroom. That is all one species, oh. agaricus bisporus, just like peppers, you know, green, yellow, orange, red, that's all one pepper, just different oh. stages of maturity. Mm -hmm. Same with all of those varieties of mushrooms. It's one mushroom and it's the least beneficial to our health. Um, some mycologists even recommend, uh, say, avoid it at all costs. Instead, there are culinary varieties that double as these functional mushrooms. Shiitake is a great example available in almost all grocery stores, right? Go towards the shiitake, the maitake, the oyster mushrooms, king trumpet, anoki. There's so many unique varieties showing up in our grocery stores. Minnesota actually has like some of the best 
mushrooms. Like we love so many mushrooms in those grocery stores out there and, and always cook them. Right. So even those contain that chitin. So sauteed Mm -hmm. soups, long boils, like if you make bone broth or something, throw them in there. That's such great advice because I mean, I love mushrooms, but you're right. I mean, those white button mushrooms, I guess, what are they really doing for us? And at farmer's markets, I've noticed the last couple of years, you can find more of the oysters, even like lion's mane, I've seen like some of these more unique ones that we're talking about today, you just have to seek them out a little bit. And you're right. We do have a lot in Minnesota. Like I I know people that have gone foraging for mushrooms here. So totally look into that. Yeah. There's there's a place called uh, Forest to Fork, which I'll just plug for them for uh, (laughs) the Minnesotans and they grow. It's an, it's a live installation and it's with Yeah. Yeah, so you can you can watch the lion's mane grow and then go buy it fresh right there. And what better way, you know, when I think about spending our dollar, it's like, that's our investment. When we make an investment in a stock, it's like, oh, I believe in your future. So I'm going to invest in what you're doing today. Same thing when we are at the grocery store. Do we believe in, you know, the future of fungi? Buying a shiitake is actually a really powerful way to say, I want more of this and I want more variety. And that's what's happening. And the amount of pounds of mushrooms we're consuming on average in in the West is skyrocketed. So it's happening and, and it's so exciting and we just put some more power back into our own hands. Yes. But with your dollar, everyone. Exactly. So many questions. I, I could just keep going on and on and I know we're running out of time here. <laughs> So what would be the top thing you would recommend to our listeners today as we start to wrap up the conversation? Like if there was one thing they could do to start implementing something mushroom in their lives. Bringing in, deciding today, you know, after listening to this to start with one, you know, if there was one mushroom that resonated with you, just start with that one, meet yourself where you're at and see if you can have fun with it and find a creative way to bring it into your routine every day this week. So, you know, mushroom coffee is the place I always recommend people starting. If you drink coffee, upgrade to mushroom coffee. You would never know it's in there. These are bitter. They taste just like the coffee flavor. It's like such a great way to hide them and not do anything new and get in, you know, a full supplement in your cup of coffee. So that's probably the simplest place to start. But again, it's what it's what's going to work for you in your life. So if you are really called to reishi, find some reishi this week. You know, you'll be surprised. It'll it'll show up to you for you. If if you're like, oh, that that's speaking to me. Next time you go to the grocery store, like, wow, there's an end cap with reishi on it. <laughs> like, um, but just start. Yeah. Just start today. Pick a mushroom and begin to bring it into your into your kitchen. Which one's that's- your favorite? I knew you were going to ask me this. <laughs> a favorite child. It changes so much. <laughs> um, today, which one's your favorite today? How's that? Today's a reishi day. Today's a reishi day. Reishi is so underrated. I think people want the like quick, sexy, like I want that nootropic or like the cordyceps energy. And reishi is like so underrated. And yet historically and herbally, reishi is like takes the cake as the most powerful, the most multifaceted the best for longevity. And so it's more quiet and subtle. But it's like, that's, I think, where where true benefits come from when we're kind of slowly, slowly feeding. It's like adding nutrients and good spring water to the roots of our body. That's great advice. And I'll just put a plug for your little hot cocoa packet that has the reishi in it. So Um, good. Perfect for this time of year. And I brought it skiing with me so I can have my little hot chocolate on the mountain too. So Just another way to, you know, ease it into your lifestyle. Thanks, Stephanie. I've been saying for years, I'm like, can ski resorts carry reishi cacao instead of this like gross powdered Swiss mess or (laughs) mess with 20 grams of sugar? Yeah. Reishi cacao. You'll feel so much better. All these ski athletes out there. (laughs) Exactly. So Danielle, this conversation has been so amazing. I feel like we could talk all day. We should have you back on for a part two at some point, but where can people find you? How can they connect with you? How can they shop for Sigmatic? I know you have a special offer for our listeners and then also where they can find your book, Healing Adaptogens. Yes. So you can find me at Danielle Ryan Broida on social. My herbal website is DanielleRyanWellness.com. 
Um, for all things Four Sigmatic, you can go to at Four Sigmatic on all social channels or foursigmatic.com. And then to grab a copy of the book, it's available on ebook, um, on audiobook. And then, of course, it's a hardcover if you want to uh, throw it as a stocking stuffer. And you can go to healingadaptogens.com, where it's also available all places books are sold. So Barnes & Noble, Booktopia, Amazon, you name it. Fabulous. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. And as we wrap up this conversation, one question we like to ask is, what does the art of living well mean to you? Such a good question. For me, it's all about connection. And what I think mushrooms teach us overall is how to connect deeper to our own bodies, how to connect more with each other, and ultimately how to remember our connection to the planet. They are quite literally the teachers of connection. They're the grand decomposers of the world. You know, they connect life and death without fungi. We'd be under several feet of debris across the whole planet. They are connecting us in, in so many ways. And I really feel that the more we bring them into our body, the deeper understanding we have of, of what our body needs. And from there, from that clarity of connection, we can connect more compassionately and authentically to other people. And so the art of living well means to remember that connection and know that we have allies, that we've always used allies as humans. We're not supposed to do this alone, whether it's other people or plants or mushrooms. We have a huge repertoire of, of friends, of allies here to help us and support us on our journeys. And so to not be afraid to call on them and use them to be able to show up as the best version of yourself. Wow. I that love that cool. idea of the plants and the mushrooms as our allies. Uh -huh. Right. And you're like, of course, and through all of time, it was like, we never could survive without them. If you're sick, if you're pregnant, if you're like, whatever it is, we need them. And just remembering that and really not even thinking about them as medicine, but just like, yeah, of course I need this at this time. Just like I need food or different nourishment or I need vitamins at this time or I need magnesium. We need what what these ingredients can offer us. Yeah, that's such great wisdom and insight just to kind of get back to Mother Earth and the planet. We all coexist together. Like you said, we're allies. And I think we've sometimes tend to forget that in our day-to-day -day lives. So, well, thank oh. you so much for coming on, Danielle. This was wonderful conversation, super enlightening. And we know our listeners are going to get a lot out of this episode. Thank you for having me. It's truly been my pleasure and much love as we like. <laughs> Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.